calls meeting the Hampton Roads Planning and District Commission for on January 17, 2019. Supposed to be 1230. Tom's ran over to 1245. <laughs> All right. Um, here, motion for approval or modification of the agenda. So I move to a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. No public comments submitted. Correct. Yes, sir. Okay. We'll go into the public comment period. Do we have any speaker cards? We do not believe we have any uh, speakers signed up for public comment. Um, last call, I believe we do have one gentleman, Mr. Mark the door to talk. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Honorable Commissioners, and fellow interested parties. I meant to pull out that card. That's all right. See you in a moment. Um, I came before you a couple of months ago with uh, some dire news about 80 feet of sea level rise. I want to follow up on that with uh, an appeal to all of you to encourage residents of your localities and your jurisdictions to purchase federal flood insurance. And rather the dire prediction of, of uh, biblical flooding occurs or not, we have enough events in recent history that should make people take a good look at that. We have Hurricane Sandy, we have Hurricane Florence, we have Hurricane Michael, and to me the worst of them all is Hurricane Harvey, got maybe 60 inches of rainfall in a couple of days. Everybody who lives in our region should have flood insurance. So, the other thing that I have talked to you about before, I hope you will continue to work on this, is getting the federal government to change the rules so that people can buy their flood insurance through monthly installments. Um, for some residents, those in the most at risk portions of the area, the premiums are so high that the costs become prohibitive when you pay them a lump sum. But for people at the lower end of the economic <coughs> ladder, even a $500 annual premium can be a major step in the line. So if the federal government would, would allow people to pay incrementally, month by month, that would be a help to getting people insured. When you look at the statistics in, in the recent hurricanes of people in, in areas that were affected by the storms I mentioned, it's only a small percentage who have flood insurance. And the rest of them are left to the charity of congressional appropriation. And we see how that's working right now. So again, Please encourage everybody in your jurisdictions to purchase flood insurance. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, we'll go ahead and close the public comment period. And I want to the executive director for your report. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A couple items I'd like to bring the members' attention. Uh, first, at each of your places, you should have a brochure uh, titled Hampton Roads Regional Legislative Priorities. Uh, these, uh, this pamphlet represents the regional legislative priorities adopted by the HRPBC, this commission, and also the Hampton Roads Transportation Planning Organization um, in our items that we will be advocating for this General Assembly session. So I wanted everybody to have a, a copy of that. Second item I wanted to note is that on January the 31st, the HRPBC and the HRTPO have been invited to Richmond. Um, it's an early morning at 8 a.m. that we have been invited to address the Hampton Roads Caucus. So I will be coordinating with members of this commission and 
also the TGO uh, to maybe come up and um, annually we present to the those caucus to express to them our items of regional importance legislatively. So we look forward to the, uh, that opportunity on January the 31st. A couple other, other items before you. Um, another handout that you have um, is from Ask HR Green. It's called the Green Learning Guide. I wanted everybody or the commission members to have a copy of that should be an issue of crisis. Uh, this comes from your Ask HR Green program that you fund as localities to do environmental education. Every third grader that's in a public school in Hampton Roads received one of these. Over 20,000 have been printed. Um, and I think as you go through this, you'll find it's very user-friendly. It attempts to reach our, our children. Um, third grade and really start the environmental education um, um, message. Um, Katie Culver, uh, we've we met before along with Rebecca Easton, but uh, great work working with your staff, your localities on this. Katie was again fantastic work, but wanted everybody to have a copy of this Ask HR Green Education material. And to have you know this is made this way to, to your um, school students. And then finally, um, also at each of your places, we have a lot of handouts here, there's a lot of work going on. Um, we have a brief one page of offshore wind, uh, which is entitled What If But When. Um, you will recall that we had a couple of presentations and discussions here at the Planning District Commission about offshore wind. Uh, now we want to pivot into how we prepare as a region for job generation related to this opportunity. Uh, for the Hampton Rose region. So I wanted to uh, draw that to everybody's attention as well. Um, and Mr. Chairman, I believe as part of my report, first I think you have two introductions to make. Yes, we have commission members. Yes. And then we have uh, our first one, Virginia Beach. Ms. Wooten, welcome. And from York County, Ms. Noel, welcome. Chairman of the board, Jim Eisenhower. Jim Perry is over in the corner. He wanted to come hear what we're doing and, and what's going on in all, all our committees, so he'll be coming to several of them and um, sitting back listening, making sure we're all on our toes. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. All right, um, now next on the, the agenda is Team Up to Clean Up, and it's an honorary board, and um, this spring, Hinkle Roads will be the national kickoff location for 2019 Great American Cleanup, the nation's largest community improvement program. The mayors and chairs will receive a letter from me on Team Up to Clean Up and invite you to serve on this honorary board. And Mayor Tuck has already said he would be glad to join another committee. <laughs> Mayor Tuck, we're wearing him out. <laughs> um, um, we're also inviting Governor Ralph Norton and his wife Pam to serve on, as board's co-chair and the mayors and the county board chairs and the military commanding officers in the region to also serve on this honorary <coughs> board. It is our hope that your support on this board will generate local recognition. I ask that you would confirm participation on this honorary board by February 15, 2019. The event will be held on May 3rd and 4th, 2019. Each locality through coordination with HR Green and Dialogue Work in the program will invite the host and organization on multiple community improvement projects involved in the engagement of hundreds of volunteers for a half day of work on either day. The projects may include litter cleanup, park spruce ups, getaway beautification, weapons, Tree planning teams of volunteers will recruit the local military and commanders in cooperation with the citizens group in order to make this a successful event. So it's one of the biggest events that, that we put on, I believe, it, correct? As far as organizing and putting together yes, our cleanup? Yes, SHR Green has done this previously. It's just that the honorary board is symbolic that hopefully is a group that can um, generate interest as we try to move together as a region towards this. So, um, as Chair Hibble indicated, that letter will be coming under his signature. We'll be getting that out uh, very soon. We would ask for everybody to meet your appointment by February 15th. And that way we can keep having meetings on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, next we'll move into the consent agenda. 
Yes. And um, do you go ahead with the consent? Yes, sir. Uh, very uh, 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 standard items, the meeting minutes, the treasurer's reports, a minor budget amendment. There is one item, though, I'd like to bring to everybody's <coughs> attention, and that is uh, we have, we're going to ask for your approval of the regional board meeting schedule for 2019. I'd like to bring everybody's attention to letter E, though. A proposed resolution recognizing the city of Portsmouth's comprehensive plan for addressing resiliency. And Mayor Rowe, I, first I want to start by congratulating you and the city. Um, the, code, the, the Code of Virginia requires localities in Hampton Roads to incorporate in their comprehensive plan updates now provisions, policies, recommendations to address sea level rise and coastal resiliency and requires the localities to demonstrate that they've collaborated with other locales. Um, this is a resolution recognizing the city of Portsmouth came forward to your Coastal Resiliency Committee. Mayor Rose staff has collaborated with other localities in the region and we're asking as part of this consent agenda from the PDC that we pass a resolution supporting Portsmouth's comprehensive plan update and those resiliency strategies we think of So um, all of you will eventually be bringing those resolutions to us as you do your comprehensive plan updates. Um, the Build One Portsmouth Comprehensive Plan, and you have the website there, is the first one to come before the PDC. So I wanted to mention that. Um, with that brief overview, Mr. Chairman, I would recommend approval of the consent agenda by the PDC board. And motion for approval. So uh, second. Second. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed nay. The abstentions. All right. So um, I'd like to invite our two guests with us today. Uh, we're good friends of Sean Avery, who is the uh, president and CEO of the Hampton Roads Workforce Council in South Hampton Roads, and Bill Mann, uh, who is the executive director for the Greater Peninsula Workforce Development Board. Uh, this, I think, ties into the conversations we've been having about economic development opportunities, uh, we don't get too far down that journey without talking about workforce and workforce preparation. I know our two workforce boards are working very hard together on some items. This would be a great opportunity to have a brief meeting on some of their efforts. So, thanks for being with us. Well, thank you for having us today. And I uh, appreciate the opportunity to come in and talk about some of the great things we've got going on when it comes to workforce development. Bill, Bill has uh, given me the honor of going through the presentation mostly, but if there's any questions <laughs> that pop up. Uh, we're here for moral support. Yes, thank you. <laughs> but it shows we're here together. So um, I've come and presented before on one of the Hampton Roads Workforce Council. At that time, it was called Opportunity Inc. Uh, we recently started a rebranding to the Hampton Roads Workforce Council. What I'm here today to really talk to you about is the exciting things we have going on in partnership with our peninsula. Uh, our Peninsula counterpart, the Greater Peninsula Workforce uh, Board, which used to be called the Peninsula Council for Workforce Development, so they've gone through a rebranding as well. As most of you know around the table, businesses do not really care where their individuals who work in the road. They're really looking for quality talent. And so in, your, in this region, we have two workforce development boards who have worked very closely together for many years, but really it's always been about what we can do on our side, what they can do on their side, with a little bit of collaboration. Bill and I have worked together for about 20 years, uh, and, and so we figured, hey, we can do better than this. For our region, for our economy, we need to start figuring out ways we can better collaborate. And what I'm excited to say is both of our boards recently signed a resolution establishing the Southeastern Virginia Workforce Regional Collaborative. And what this really means is we are now working seamlessly as two boards working as one. Uh, no, no M words, no mergers happening at this point in time. Uh, but we're working closely, seamlessly when it comes to serving our business community and serving the partners that we represent. So what I'm going to do today is kind of give you some uh, high points on what we're doing. We're still working out some of the details, but it's uh, it's an exciting time. All of our boards are on, on uh, together, working this together. We both have elected officials. Many around this table serve on my board or serve on those boards, so they've been uh, heavily involved in this discussion as well. And we've had no pushback whatsoever, so very excited about that. very happy to see what we're doing. First of its kind in the state, handful of its kind in the nation, actually. So, uh, just to kind of refresh you on the workforce development system, I've, I've, I've put this slide up just to kind of show you what we do on the south side. Bill has almost the exact similar situation on the peninsula. There's, there's my organization, and then we have what we call our, um, 
our product lines kind of. We have our one-stop system that works with individuals. We have our business services division, which works with the employer. We have our youth uh, divisions that work with our uh, emerging workforce. We have some programs that work with our library systems. We have a Veterans Employment Center. They're, they've got some veterans initiatives on their side. And we both have a 501 c 3 organization. So we all have the same parts. So why don't we figure out where those parts make sense and start pulling them together? So one of the areas that we're working very closely on is, is what we call our Virginia Career Works, which is our one-stop systems. Um, for many, many years, there's been two brands. There's been a number of brands across the state where the, the centers where individuals can go to and get the services that they need to get connected to the workforce. Ours were called the Opium and One-Stop Workforce Centers on our side. They were called Peninsula WorkLink on the peninsula. And it's just confusing. I mean, if you're an individual who lives in Norfolk and you move to Hampton, you've got to figure out the new name. So with the help of the state, they've actually rebranded all the one stops across the, the Commonwealth of Virginia to what they're calling Virginia Career Works. So on the south side, I have four Virginia Career Works. So think of it as a franchise like McDonald's. I've got four different uh, franchises for the Virginia Career Works uh, brand. On the peninsula, Bill has the Virginia Career Works Hampton Center. So now it just makes sense that anybody who's looking for a job or looking to get connected to the workforce, they know they can go to the Virginia Career Works and it's the same services they get on my side that they get on the Hampton side. Another area we're looking to very closely collaborate on is really working with the veterans population. I had the opportunity to present uh, the veterans, this presentation on the Veterans Employment Center to Marumpa uh, a few months ago. This past May, we opened up for March, we opened up the Hampton Road Veterans Employment Center in Norfolk. This center is just like our career centers that we have, but it's solely focused on helping the veterans, <coughs> transition service members, and their families get connected to the workforce or get connected with education. Every one of these partners around this table already were offering uh, services to the veterans community, but we were all offering it in our own silos. So what we came together on the south side was collaborate very closely. It's not that we're eliminating any of these programs, we're just solely working together. In our center that we have over at Military Circle, every one of these partners comes out at least once or twice a month to actually meet with the veterans. And we also refer back. So it's not that there's a lack of services for veterans, as everybody knows, it's a lack of coordination of those services. It's overwhelming sometimes for the transition and service member. And so this that's what the concept is was here to kind of better con connect those resources together. And so what we're doing now is talking with Bill about expanding this Veterans Employment Center to the Peninsula. And so we're in the talks right now to bring this model to the Peninsula, and Bill will be taking the lead on it with our support, and we'll have this model where a transition service member coming out of Langley will have the same services they can get coming out of the um, station North. Just some stats last year, since we've even been open in March, we've served over 1,600 veterans. So we only know that, that that just proves that the model is there. They need these services, they're looking for these type of activities. One of the other exciting areas uh, that we're partnering on is uh, the Hampton Roads Workforce Council received a grant from the Hampton Roads Community Foundation to establish what we're calling the Hampton Roads Veterans Career Compass. So think of the Veterans Employment Center as the high-touch facility where an individual can actually get one-on-one -on -one service. This is the high-tech component of it. Uh, this will be launching here within the next few weeks where a company can post their, their job openings on this website, specifically if they're working with veterans or transition service members. The veteran and transition and service member can post their, their uh, military transcript and it will connect the two together. It will create them an official resume and it will make that connection. And all of this is free of charge to the employer and to the individual. Uh, so right now we're recruiting employers. Um, and as soon as we get a, a good number of employers on the site, then we will launch it to the individuals. We want to make sure we have some capacity in there before we launch that. So that'll be a true regional effort that we're doing together. And at some point, the state's even looking to uh, expand this to the state. Some other areas where we're collaborating together is around our next generation, our emerging workforce. Right now, we have a youth career center on the south side. Bill has a youth workforce center on the peninsula, and we're figuring out ways that we can better collaborate those, those efforts together, talking about the emerging workforce. It's, I mean, talking about the opportunities that are available here in the region, connecting up with internships, connecting them up with summer job opportunities, uh, mentorship activities. So we're going to be very closely coordinating when it comes to next-gen type of activities. 
continuing on that path, uh, we're very excited that we've um, started just recently, and some may have received an email from us, we're doing a Hampton Roads talent alignment strategy where we're working with the business community to not identify what jobs they have opening at this time, but identify what skill sets that they are in need of, both now and in the future. We're taking that information, sharing it with our educational partners, determining what they are actually producing right now, and seeing where the gaps are. That's really what we need to do. We need to determine what's missing in our educational system that's not meeting the employer's needs. So uh, we're doing focus groups now. That report should be done in May. Uh, with that report, we'll have a roadmap that we can then take to funding sources to help fill those gaps in those educational partnerships. Um, another component of that is the Hampton Roads Coalition for Talent Development. What we've been able to do is bring together the four community colleges that represent our Go Virginia region. We've brought together Old Dominion University, Norfolk State, ECPI, the K-12 system, and really what we're doing for the first time is meeting together to talk about what our workforce needs are in this region, and when it makes sense, investing in those, those efforts. Just this morning, uh, John Dever, the president of uh, Thomas Nelson Community College on the peninsula, and myself, presented to the Go Virginia, um, presented our application to Go Virginia for funding to help support this effort, and it was very well received, and Bill's been a primary partner with that as well. So, very excited about that effort, and again, this is gonna be how we start attracting and developing our talent here in the region. Another area, again, as I mentioned, businesses and employers are our primary customer when it comes to the, the work that we're doing at our, both of our organizations, and so, We've, we've, for many, many years, would go to a prospect visit for the Hampton Roads Economic Development, and both of us would be sitting in the room talking about our, our, pro, our uh, products that we can offer, and it was the exact same speech. So an employer was here, and, oh, I can offer that, and Bill can offer the exact same thing. Well, now we're not doing that anymore. If he can make the meeting and I can't, he'll go. And we have something we made of Steve Cook. We actually have a person on my staff that will now be representing the whole region when it comes to business and employer engagement. <laughs> Single point of contact when it comes to businesses. Um, we're also taking all of our, um, all of our uh, forms and various policies that we have when it comes to on-the-job training, customized training, uh, when it comes to internships and work experiences and incumbent work training and mirroring it together so that, uh, that when somebody fills out an application for me, it goes right to Bill. It's the same type of application. No need for two different applications that may have had just a slight different variation because we interpreted something a little bit different. We're now going to have uh, where we, it's a seamless process for the employer and they don't have to worry about whose policy they're following. Again, hiring events, job posting, pre-qualification of employees, labor market information is another big one where we are, we used to produce a labor market digest uh, once a quarter. They had a labor market information system. We are now producing one report for the whole region, including state of the workforce reports and other activities such as that. Two of the most exciting things that we're getting involved in that's really demonstrating this partnership is, and neither, I'm, I'm not in that picture, so I don't want you to think that I've dyed my hair or anything. Uh, America Builds and Great, uh, Repairs Great Ships is a perfect example of how we collaborate. Newport News Shipbuilding and Virginia Ship Repair Association and their memberships are really starting to figure out how they're going to meet that 355 Navy that the government is proposing. And they need a lot of workers and they need them quick and they need them skilled up. So what Bill and I have done is we've taken it on that we're going to invest in that, uh, that opportunity. You can't really see it, but that check right there is for $150,000 in training funds that we're both investing together into this initiative. First time that that's ever happened, um, and so we're, again, speaking with one voice to support the America Builds and Prepares Great Ships. Another thing I know you're talking about it today, or it's, it's coming up, is the emerging offshore wind industry. So the Hampton Roads Workforce Council, on behalf of those sides, actually served as the workforce uh, component of the study that the governor just released. We were the ones that convened the, uh, all the partners in the K-12 to make sure that we were going to have the workforce that's needed for this offshore wind when it happens. Um, they tie very closely together with America, builds and great, uh, repairs great ships, a lot of similar skill sets. But we were the workforce pieces um, that came together. And so we're, as this continues to grow, we'll be there right at the table to make sure that we're developing that workforce that's needed to meet the needs of those industries. And lastly, before we take questions, 
the next steps for this collaborative is actually for the first time in the 20 years I've been around here, we're having a joint executive committee meeting in February, um, and then we're having a joint board meeting in March. Bill's board's about 40 members, my board's about 40 members, so there's a lot of people going to come together, but it just makes sense that we get together and discuss these issues. And so in March, we'll be having that joint board meeting, and uh, many of you around the table that I know are on my board and, and Bill's board will be there as well. So uh, it's an exciting time when it comes to workforce development. Workforce development is economic development, so if you're involved in economic development, you know that talent, talent, talent is the top thing that's going on now. And so Maddie just wanted you guys to know that we are working on that talent together uh, in this new collaborative. Bill, did you want to add anything? I think we well. All right, do we have any questions? Yes. Um, this is great. Thank you for the working together. I think that's wonderful. Um, I wanted to share an experience I had just this past week. We had, I got an email from um, a, a tech company that's growing in Norfolk called Amplified IT, and they're trying to recruit some of their um, some of their folks, tech folks from New York, to uh, to the region, and was asked about uh, quality of life, schools, etc. And I appreciate we're, we're working on workforce specific skill sets. But the piece of the puzzle that I think may be missing, both here, maybe Heretta, is how do we sell the quality of life that is Hampton Roads? How do we how do we sell that? Where is that happening? And how can we provide that to our companies so that they can also use that as a tool to encourage more folks to come to our region? I know Visit Norfolk does a great job. Uh, Virginia Beach, Newport News, Hampton, all of us have our, our respective a convention and choice bureaus, but I don't see a piece that really says, come home to Virginia. <coughs> what is that all about? And the other thing is, I think that we're really missing out on is the boomerang kids, folks who grew up in the area, who wanted to go out and do their own thing, now they're starting to settle down. This was the case with my family. We moved back to the area because of family and great quality of life. How do we capitalize on that? I don't know if that's you all, but I think with the regional thinkers and leaders that are in this room, we need to do a better job of selling who we are. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, I think it's a big deal that the two uh, organizations are working as one. And uh, I think we need to celebrate that. So if it's in order, I'd like to offer a motion that we commend the two executive directors for uh, working this out. I second that. Yes. All in favor say aye. Aye. Right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And if I may say, Sean, I'm on your board along with uh -huh. Mayor Rowe and I, and we view this as a start to regionalism. It has to start somewhere, and I think that Mr. Adrian, Mr. Mann, you've taken on that task to, to start it within the various um, cities within the region. So I personally would like to commend you because I'm very excited about the two boards coming together, acting as one, and using the resources to help all of our cities within the Hampton Road. So thank you. Um, if I may, Sean, just two questions. Um, your youth workforce center, any idea of how many participants you have in this program? And maybe you could provide a little more Sure. Um, so for our youth career center, um, we had uh, 7,000 participants through that those programs. Um, and it's a little misnomer. There there is a physical center, but there's also <coughs> people out of the schools and work within the communities. Uh, our physical center is located at Tidewater Community College in the Beach Campus. So, as you can imagine, that's kind of far down in the beach. Uh, so it does. It's hard for people in Norfolk or Portsmouth or Franklin, Southampton, uh, to really reach those. So we go out in the schools and do that. I know Bill and them do the same thing on the peninsula. They have their Youth Career Expo, which serves about 3,000 youth. Um, and Bill may want to mention that. Sure. If you be cooperating with the uh, Virginia Peninsula Chamber of Commerce to host a Youth Career Expo on an annual basis, and we serve all of the school divisions within the peninsula as well as a couple uh, outside of our particular region, and about 2,500 to 3,000 youth come. We have mock interviews, we have workshops, we have displays uh, illustrating various uh, occupations with in-demand uh, industries and businesses and such. We really want to work to get the young people excited 
about the opportunities that we have here in the greater Hampton Roads region and such, and uh, help connect their education, their high school education, with post-secondary education opportunities and career <coughs> pathways that will put them on the right path. So, yeah, it's, it's uh, quite a program. And Mr. Chairman, if I may, just in terms of connection to our previous discussion, Sean and Bill, we've been having a lot of conversation around offshore wind, regional resolution of support, particularly related to the economic growth opportunities. Um, could you talk a little bit about any workforce development training that you're starting to wrap around the disciplines that can support that image? Yeah, so when they were doing the, um, producing the study for the governor, uh, as I mentioned, we were kind of the workforce development convener for that. And what we did around that was we brought together the community colleges, we had K-12 representatives, and we had four-year institution representatives to hear what the, the needs are going to be. And, and it, as I mentioned, it's not very unlike the shipbuilding, ship repair industry. It's, it's around a lot of te technician type levels. So the community colleges are developing um, pathways for those areas. So is the K-12 system. So, you know, that, as we ramp that, that industry up, the programs will be ready to ramp up as well. Um, and so having those individuals at the table, why we're starting to ramp up, that's what's important because you don't want the industry to start producing these uh, wind turbines and getting them all offshore and not have the workers to meet the needs. So they need to be there at the beginning, and, that, and that's kind of where we are at this point in time. Thank you, Sean Bill. Appreciate all your hard work. Thank you. Great to see y'all working together, pulling that together. Thank you very much for all your efforts. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Have a great day. All right, we'll move on the way. Yes, this presentation is our annual presentation. Uh, Mr. Greg Green, of course, our chief economist on our regional economic forecast. I almost want to stand up and applaud Sean and Bill. That regional collaboration is just, I mean, that's just incredible. From the economists looking at this from the outside and the inside and all those ways around, it's just absolutely fantastic. It's that collaboration it is really what's going to help drive the economy. Um, we've been doing a regional forecast for, this is our 29th year. Uh, I haven't been doing it all 29 years, but the PDC has. And, um, you know, when I look at regional forecasting, economic forecasting, and go through a lot of economic forecasts in this process. Uh, it's, it's always pretty clear, you know, you review previous forecasts, and, and there's no crystal ball, and what, what crystal ball you do have is certainly broken by things like a 27-day partial shutdown. It's really difficult to look into the future, and I think the benefit of, of getting up in front of you is really to, to lay out in front of you what the regional landscape looks like in economic terms more so than, than uh, take a guess as to what's going to happen in the future. So with that in mind, um, I'll take you through just a few slides, well maybe a little more than a few. Uh, but I'll start with the, the national economy, which we consistently look to. Um, currently we are up 23.8% from the pre-recession low when we look at gross domestic product, the national scale. We have hit, uh, well, we, are, we probably will hit above 3% GDP growth for 2018, and that'll be the first time we've seen above 3% growth since 2005. Um, so we have seen a pretty long and consistent trend here with respect to GDP growth, uh, non-farm civilian employment. This is the headline employment numbers that you see uh, month in, month out. Um, We've seen 1.7% uh, growth consistently since the, the pre-recession low. And again, here too, you can see there's been a very long and consistent trend going all the way back to 2010. If we look at the unemployment rate, the unemployment rate has dropped by more than half. Uh, this last month, it bumped up to 3.9% from 3.7%. That was not a bad thing. That was actually a really good thing. We're seeing more people coming into the labor force. That's what we want to see. Uh, so the unemployment rate, at the national level is nearing full employment and, uh, and is very healthy. Um, the stock market, uh, which I would never want to try and predict, has, has been doing pretty well uh, relative, you know, if we look back to where we were from the recession low, we're up 256%, 69% uh, from peak, but uh, it's, it's uh, been a little bit shaky in recent months. Uh, 
um, but still, uh, relative to where we were in the, the um, Great Recession, we've seen significant growth. So if we look to Hampton Roads, I know I've shown you this chart uh, several times, and I think it's, it's always just an important one to go back to. What I'm showing here, um, three different lines. The black one is the US, Orange, Virginia, and the green line is Hampton Roads. And this essentially goes back to when the recession, the Great Recession started, so we can kind of measure where we, how far we've come. And with the black line, you can see the, the US went into recession, uh, they hit bottom, and they uh, moved steadily uh, out of recession. Virginia, the orange line, we didn't quite have that same consistency. We bounced around a bit, but it took, uh, it took several years, uh, 70 plus months, for them to regain all the jobs that they lost through the Great Recession. And in 2014, both the US and Virginia regained all the, the jobs that they had lost. One thing you'll notice about the green line is it's longer. Uh, part of the reason is that we entered into recession before the nation and before the Commonwealth. We actually entered, we dipped down uh, the same month the four plant closed in Norfolk. So that's when Hampton Roads hit recession and clearly we've had a much more difficult time trying to work our way out of this recession. Uh, we did not regain the, the, the civilian jobs, the non-farm civilian jobs uh, until April of 2018, when four years later after uh, the U.S. and the Commonwealth. So we've had a rather tough time digging out of the recession. We've regained our jobs. Um, although we've regained our jobs, if you look at our gross product, we still, if we compare ourselves to where we were in 2017, and this is in real terms, it's inflation adjusted. So are we better off now than we were then? Well, not quite. Uh, we're still at, we see a 2.1% decline from where we were back in 2007 with respect to regional gross product. So we have a way to go. If we compare ourselves to other metropolitan regions, this is regions uh, we usually use between one and four million. Uh, you can see that over the past three years, we're on the bottom end there. We compare rather poorly. Uh, you know, you see uh, Milwaukee, Rochester, Tucson on the lower end, and San Jose, Austin, San Antonio on the higher end. But you can see that Hampton Roads is not comparing well with other metropolitan regions. So if we look, how, how have we done over the past 10 years with respect to employment? Uh, certainly the experience has not been consistent across industries. Some industries have done really well. Uh, healthcare, which has seen tremendous growth at the federal level, but also in Hampton Roads. Uh, leisure and hospitality, which is vitally important to the regional economy, one of our pillars, federal government, scientific, technical. They've seen solid growth over the past decade. <coughs> We look down on the other end, uh, you might recognize that one there, local government has had a very difficult time. Construction, information, wholesale trade, so there are certainly areas that have struggled over the past decade and, and have not regained their employment figures. If we look at this, this is for Hampton Roads, non-farm non civilian jobs. It's essentially, these are the jobs numbers that you see. And we're up uh, 57,000 jobs from where we were in 2007. You can see it's been that long, bumpy ride. If you look in the past year, we've gained almost 10,000 jobs just in that past year. And so growth in Hampton Roads in the past year, we, we finally look like we've hit our pace there. Um, again, not consistent across job sectors, uh, scientific, technical at the top, leisure, hospitality, very important to the region. Manufacturing, we've seen manufacturing growth, growth in the past year. And then on the bottom end there, you can see we lost some information jobs, education services, administrative support, and, and some federal government jobs. Uh, I've never been a real huge fan of the unemployment rate. People use it, I think, in the wrong context. But one thing that is really important is the trend lines that are associated with the unemployment rate. So here you can see, again, the U.S. is in black, Virginia is orange, and Hampton Roads is in green. The interesting thing here is these trend lines. Um, people like to look at, dissect the unemployment rate, and they should. Um, there are six different measures of unemployment rate, um, so depending on how you want to analyze it. Typically, U3 is a headline unemployment number, but the, the reality is all unemployment figures, all unemployment <coughs> rates are following the same trend line. So if you include the, the maximum amount you can, discourage workers, underemployed workers, marginally attached, it's all showing the same trend. And that's also true by race, by education, by gender. Um, all these trends are going the same way, which has been really positive. 
This is, uh, is meant to kind of look a bit silly. This is much more important than unemployment to me. So essentially, this is your labor force in Hampton Roads. The red is the people who are unemployed. The green is the people who are employed. So you put, look at it and say, well, it hasn't, doesn't look like it's changed a whole lot. And uh, this is going back to 2000. And that's true. That's kind of the point. I mean, the economy is huge. The economy of the region is huge. So there are things that impact it. And even these really significant impacts that we feel uh, are, are relatively small when you look at just how large the economy is, how big our labor force is. We start to dissect it a little bit. This is the, this is the unemployed people in Hampton Roads. These, these are the people who, when they call up and they do a survey, are you employed, yes or no? These are the people who say, no, I'm unemployed. And that number has dropped 55% um, since its, its peak in 2009, 2010. Uh, that's a pretty si significant drop, um, so over half. If we look at it a little bit differently, here's the long-term average number of unemployed persons in Hampton Roads, and this, this goes back to 1990, well longer than this chart. But on average, we have around 38,000 people in Hampton Roads that are unemployed. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, that's a healthy economy to have a level of employment, of full employment. Um, so right now, if you look where we are in 2018, you compare that to also the, the long-term average rate. The long-term average rate in Hampton Roads is 4.8%. Um, we're actually pretty far below the, the long-term average rate and long-term average number. So in terms of the unemployed in Hampton Roads, we're essentially uh, where you might consider the region to be at full employment which is a good thing. Uh, full employment provides upward pressure on uh, wages, and that's something we certainly want to see. If you look at the labor force here, if we just saw uh, a, lot of, a lot fewer unemployed people without looking at the labor force, it wouldn't give us the full information. But the fact that our labor force is growing and that the number of un unemployed people is declining is pretty healthy. Uh, we saw pretty significant growth in the labor force through the 2000 era. Uh, and then just recently, in the last couple of years, we've seen some growth climbing back up. So again, a combination of low unemployment with a, a rising labor force should put upward pressure on wages, uh, which we need in the region. Um, one of the reasons I say we need that is this is comparing incomes in Hampton Roads to the U.S. So that U.S. the U.S. is that black line. When we're above 100 percent. We are above average income uh, in the U.S. The green is per capita income and the blue bar is average wages and salaries. So you can see if you go all the way back to 2001, we're nowhere close to where the U.S. is in terms of average wages and salaries. Um, and per capita income bumped up once in 2009. Uh, the region's um, per capita income rose above the national level. The interesting thing there is that wasn't because we saw a big bump in income. We actually declined by 2% that year. But the federal at the national level, they declined by 4%. So, so we went uh, higher than them in terms of per capita income. But this is an area of Hampton Roads that, that we would like to see some wage growth here. We're desperately <coughs> need some wage growth here. And uh, this kind of puts that in perspective. Yes. But Greg, excuse me for just talking about uh, this this tells a tale of cost to us, cost of government. To, you know, as we search for talent at the manager level to fill all those positions, uh, we we uh, re recruitment retention is one of all managers' primary responsibilities, and all of us are struggling to to fill the bill to meet your expectations and service delivery to the constituency and the businesses here in Hampton Roads. And this chart here is, uh, is, is telling us that the cost of government has to go up in order to compete for the talent necessary to be the region that we are. And, and, and we have uh, enjoyed uh, low salary ranges to provide government in our jurisdictions. And as elected officials, I'm just kind of uh, throwing a star, red star cluster out there to say that all the managers in here are really are really struggling to, to meet our recruitment and retention standards because 
people won't stay here and work for us as the economy improves, as they provide better, equal um, you know, benefits than what we can now offer in government, especially with our new uh, pay uh, programs uh, that have changed the dynamics uh, of working for the government. And so that is, that is a very serious chart. It's a very expensive chart, and it's one that eventually we're going we're gonna to see the impacts on our budgets to support the quality of service delivery. And I appreciate the opportunity. That's a, that's a fantastic point. I think one of the things, people look at this one of two different ways, but the reality is it's a double-edged sword. Uh, for businesses, you might look at it, well, it's great to have a low cost for people uh, to, to hire people, but on the other side, this makes competition for talent incredibly tough when you pay much lower wages than uh, other places across the Commonwealth, the nation, and, and the globe, actually. So. <coughs> Uh, there is uh, some good news when it comes to incomes in Hampton Roads, and that's when we look at median family incomes. This is a very good barometer of quality of life, and I'd like to point this out that we do, we do actually track well when it comes to median family income, which is fantastic for a number of socioeconomic benefits. So we do, we do look good there. And when we're talking about income, uh, one of the biggest sources of it, of course, is uh, the DOD, which funds a, a good chunk of our economy. If we look at these annualized real defense outlays, so the reason I put this in front of you is just to show you that it does look like it's a little bit cyclical. Um, you can see the Korean War, Vietnam War, 80s Cold War buildup, war on terror. The interesting thing is if, if I overlay this with population growth in Hampton Roads, you'll see that Vietnam War bump is, a, it is when we saw population increasing in Hampton Roads significantly. Again, with the 80s Cold War buildup, we saw pretty significant increases in Hampton Roads population. And then suddenly the war on terror, you see the outlays go up, but our population did not. Uh, so there's some kind of interesting components of that. And one of them is right here. If you look at military personnel in Hampton Roads in the US, uh, you saw, you can see the, from the, the Vietnam War, us coming down a little bit, and then a uh, bump from the Cold War in terms of the number of personnel in Hampton Roads. And then with the war on terror, we did not see an associated bump with personnel. And that's because a lot of the money went into contracting. Uh, the DOD is changing how they do business, and a lot of the money that they're spending doesn't go back into personnel, so we don't see those huge bumps associated with our population when the DOD starts spending more money, even though it does really flow into the region. Uh, we talk a lot about diversification in the region, and, and this is just, I think, something to show people. If you go all the way back to 1969, uh, that's the earliest we had data for. Uh, military employment comprised, direct military employment, comprised over 25% of the region's employment. Now, we're at 8%. Uh, military income was right up there at a quarter as well, and, and now both of those are, are below 10%. So the, the DOD, as a as a portion of the, the region's economy has been diversifying for years and years and years. It's still a very, very, very important component of the economy, uh, but there's also a lot more going on in Hampton Roads. When I talked about those defense contracts, one of the things that we see here is defense contracts, this is inflation adjusted dollars. So you can compare 1995 to 2013, and it, we're talking the same dollars here, but you can see uh, with the war on terror, we did not invest in personnel, but defense contracts were huge, and that money flowed into Hampton Roads, and it flowed in, and it increased wages, and it did a lot of just to add to our population. One of the things that did hit, if you look at 2011 there, you can see what happened. Uh, suddenly, sequestration hit. We saw budget pressures in D.C., and not only after 2011, we, we continued to lose military personnel, but on top of that, we started losing defense contracts. And that is why Hampton Roads has had such a difficult time recovering from the Great Recession. It's a, it's a loss of military personnel exacerbated by a loss of defense contracting, which means the private sector in Hampton Roads has really had to swim against an outflow of federal dollars, making it really difficult for the economy to move ahead. Uh, touching a little bit on, on where defense spending is going, um, this is hardly easy. Uh, there really is no crystal ball for this. I'm going to go all the way back to the President's budget of 2012. This is the information that we kind of look at. You can see the Budget Control Act of 2011, what it said we had to do with statutory budget caps. 
And then we went through a, a series of bumps. Uh, the American Taxpayer Relief Act of 2012, uh, Bipartisan Budget Act of 2013, is essentially just kicking the can down the road. Uh, 2015, we had another one. And then, of course, this really big one here in 2018. Um, but a lot of the, the, what these have done is essentially kick the can down the road. Now, this is, uh, this is defense outlays. We also have overseas contingent operations, which means that we can spend more uh, in some degree. So this black line that I just put in here is actual expenditures. Um, so now it's as clear to you as it is to most other people. That's actually what I'm looking at. But the, what, what I want to point to in the scary part here is we look at 2020. So that's what we're up against uh, in 2020. And when I say 2020, I actually mean uh, September of this year, these budget caps come back into play. Um, so we've seen all these bumps and bumps and bumps. Um, and you can only read the tea leaves but so much to determine well, what's, good, what's that going to mean for 2020, 2021, and beyond. Uh, just touching real quick on, on the port, another uh, vital component, Hampton Roads. This shows the exports and imports going through our port. Uh, one of the things that's fascinating to me is when I overlay this on top of global trade, it matches almost perfectly. So what we're seeing at our port, whether it's increases or decreases, tends to match what's going on with global trade. If global trade increases, we'll see more cargo through the ports and vice versa. Uh, one of the things that we've noticed is containers, if we look, containers are up significantly over the past short while, but the number of ships is down. That's because these ships are huge. I hope you get to see them coming through every once in a while. It's pretty magnificent. Um, the share of East Coast ports, when we look at Hampton Roads, our port has done fantastically well. They're really competitive. Uh, they're maintaining share against a lot of other ports that are making really significant investments as well. We talked about tourism expenditures in Hampton Roads. Again, this is inflation adjusted. That's important, so you can compare across years. Uh, tourism is a, is a huge component of the region's economy, and it's very diverse in nature. So we have a lot of different components of tourism. If we look across the region, the experience is not always similar, but across the whole, we're up 13.2% from where we were pre-recession. Uh, that's fantastic. Uh, if we look at hotel revenues over the past decade, interestingly enough, we're down 2.9%. So while well, tourism expenditures up and hotel revenues are down, um, what else can we look to? Well, employment in tourism-related industry is up 6.6% over the past 10 years. So when you start looking at the VRBOs and, and the, the online um, people sharing houses and the sharing economy, even though we see a decrease in the number of people that are using hotels, that doesn't mean that there's a necessarily a, a negative impact for the region. Certainly, there's still a positive one. People are coming into the region and, uh, and through other means, and it's vitally important that we address that or uh, expand on that. Uh, retail sales, this is a kind of an interesting chart, I think. You will we'll look at this, and uh, you can see that Going back to 2007, we're up 10.5% um, from where we were. There's been a pretty continuous uh, growth trend here since 2010. Um, and if you look at it, since 2006, we've seen an annualized growth rate of 1.2% in retail sales. 1.2% isn't so bad until you adjust for inflation. Uh, so essentially what you're seeing here is we're losing 1.1% a year in retail sales since 2006. And retail sales is one of those things I think uh, people can understand that you, if you've hitched your cart to a, an old horse, um, you're gonna get less and less productivity out of it. So essentially, when we look at retail sales in Hampton Roads, one of the things that's changing, not just here, but across the Commonwealth and across the nation, is people are spending less and less on goods and more and more on services that we don't tax services in the Commonwealth. We tax very few. So if you go to the store and you buy a diaper, you pay tax on it. If you go to the hairdresser and you get your hair done, you don't pay tax on it. More and more of these expenditures are going towards services, fewer and fewer towards goods, and this really hints towards the need for tax modernization to kind of get us uh, back to where we need to be so that we can hitch our uh, wagon to a, a little bit of a different horse. Talking a bit on housing, um, the green line here, Hampton Roads, orange again, Virginia, black U.S. What, what's interesting about this is when we go back and we look 
at where we were back in 2000. We can compare how Hampton Roads housing market compares. And you, you see the significant bump. We had a lot of things happening to us in the 2000s that, um, that really benefited us. A huge increase in uh, housing pay, in military pay, and in income coming into this region, coupled with the low um, housing prices that were below market rates, really ex ex uh, pushed Hampton Roads housing prices up well above that of the Commonwealth and the nation. And then we saw uh, the, the fall as the, as the nation and the Commonwealth did as well. And since then, we have been underperforming. Um, we're, you can see the green lines below the orange line there. Uh, we're above zero, which is good, but we've still been underperforming. One of the things that's important, there's, there's a lot of dynamics going on in the housing market. And all housing markets are, are local, they're, they're not regional, they're not statewide, but there are common trends. If we look at um, Hampton Rose housing market in terms of settled sales, you can see that we're actually, the, the, there's been significant growth there. This is, this is a healthy market. This is also told by the sold time, the, the average sold time on market. If you're right around 60, uh, that's a healthy place to be. So we look at the Hampton Roads uh, housing market, and in terms of sales that the realtors are going through, we have a, house, uh, we have a, a pretty uh, healthy market. We look at housing permits in Hampton Roads, it tells us a little bit of a different story. You can see where we were back um, January of 96, even going all the way back to that time. But essentially what we're looking at here is we saw a pretty significant drop in housing permits. And this is an indicator of construction. The blue is single family, the beige is multifamily, but you can tell that we're down significantly. And what happens when we're down significantly over a long period of time is essentially we're looking at a cut in the amount of uh, supply on the market. So the cut in supply has helped revive the market in terms of sales, um, but it does some other interesting things as well. And one of those is it increases rents significantly. And when you increase rents, you make housing less affordable. And if, if you look at this black line here, I remember being in front of us 2005 and talking about housing affordability, rental affordability, and what an issue that was at Hampton Roads. And we're trending back to an issue there because we're not seeing a lot of uh, a lot of product being added to the market and the result is an increase in rents. So if rents are going up, well then housing prices should go up as well. Typically, yes, but one of the other things that's <coughs> in roads is uh, foreclosures as a share of resales. And, and we saw a pretty significant bump and then we started trending down and we, we heard all this time uh, how foreclosures were such an important component back in 2011, back in 2012, it was a really big scare. If we look at foreclosures in Hampton Roads and we compare ourselves to those other metropolitan areas again, Hampton Roads has a lot of foreclosures in the market. And that holds down housing prices. So while you see rents climbing and housing prices being relatively uh, stable, uh, housing affordability becomes an issue without the associated bump in uh, housing prices. So, so this is something that is, is something certainly worth keeping an eye on in Hampton Roads. Just looking back to how if we compare, uh, if we index back to 2000, where are we? Um, we're, we're, we've recovered, we're way above where we were in 2000, not quite where we were in 2007, but if you just look at the last little bit there, um, we expect that there's just going to be continued slow growth in housing in Hampton Roads. Uh, for, for an extended period. It's one of the things too that we're seeing at the national level that the housing is, uh, housing market is slowing somewhat, so uh, we'll probably taper that into that in Hampton Roads as well. So looking at the year ahead, um, there's some positive news here certainly. Uh, there's strong defense spending, the DOD, um, I, I like to say funded through September. Uh, there's some complications there, one of them is um, we had a debt ceiling that was essentially removed. Um, and that debt ceiling comes back into play March 1st. So March 1st, you can see uh, another fight um, in Washington. Um, that said, we have, we have strong consumer spending, uh, increasing wages in Hampton Roads. That coupled with our low employment is, is our low unemployment is, is good news for us. Corporate profits remain high. 
continued low energy prices and continued national growth. But national growth is really, really important if we want to see continued federal funds flowing in Hampton Roads. If that national growth changes, that hurts us even more than, um, than we would expect otherwise. On the other hand, uh, we do see growing risk of recession. Let's talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, there is a, a national home price acceleration <laughs> taking place. Um, and the, the, the markets there are, are showing that might be a leading economic indicator there. Uh, global trade tr tensions. Um, this one is very, very difficult to, to determine. The, the, the problem with trade tensions is uh, there are really long-term impacts that are associated with these trade tensions, and especially what's going on in China right now. Uh, we're seeing that the Chinese market is dropping, so that essentially is going to impact the U.S. There's a European slowdown. People are pretty unclear what's going to happen with Brexit, but even outside of Brexit, there is a European slowdown, which will have ramifications for the U.S. Interest rates are rising, um, and they're going to, the expectation is that they'll continue to rise even as the Fed slows down. And then, uh, really important, the divided government. So the divided government, uh, we have for 27 days into a partial shutdown, uh, the longest ever. Um, and, and we're not done with the year. Like I said, March 1st is going to be an important date. Uh, and then at the end of September, uh, we're going to have we're going to have some uh, fights again in Washington as well with ex um, with respect to expenditures. So, if we look at um, recessions, one of the things that's interesting is it is is past any indication of the future here. Right now, we're at 150 months. Since the previous recession, the, the longest since World War II was 10 years, 120 months. So we're approaching the longest expansionary period since World War II. The average expansionary period is just short of 58 months. Um, so we've seen some pretty strong, um, some pretty strong growth over that time. Uh, but now there, there are certainly uh, concerns coming up. This is uh, rather interesting as well. Um, to me anyways, if you look at gross domestic product, you can see that we've done very well right up to the blue line. But for the first time in, in, in over a decade, there is real strong consensus that, um, that growth, gross domestic product is going to be declining. The expectation for the future is, is not right. Um, there are some, there's in, Wall Street Journal did a survey in the next year, 25% of economists expected to see a recession uh, up through the end of 2020. 50% of economists expected to see a recession. Uh, so there is a lot of consensus that, that things are turning the corner here. Uh, one of the reasons, of course, is uh, you know we took up the credit card, we spent a lot of money, we saw a pretty big bump in the economy, we got the GDP up past 3%. At some point, you have to pay for that. and. Uh, Last time they decided to pay for that was in 2011. And here you can see federal budget deficits. This is significant for us because uh, we're fast approaching where we were in 2011. And if you look at what's going to happen, we have to revisit these conversations. Like I said, at the end of September this year, uh, these federal budget deficits are going to be coming back into play. And sequestration hit us really hard. Um, so when we're looking at what the expenditures are right now, things look really good. Um, but the writing is kind of on the wall. This is Congressional Budget Office forecast, and, and many economists say these are rosy. So I don't see this as, as rosy in any way, um, but a little bit cautionary. So when we're looking to the next year, um, this is the, the, the forecast for 2019. We see at the national level, uh, the, we expect that GDP will come down a bit, 2.6%. We're going to see the increase in interest rates, uh, short term from 2.0 to 2.8, long term from 2.9 to 3.3. Uh, you'll see a little bit of compression there between short term and long term interest rates. Uh, we're looking at Hampton Roads, our forecast for the year, uh, assuming, this is assuming that we see an end to this partial shut government shutdown. Uh, we have really no idea what's going to happen there, but assuming that we get back on track quickly, we expect the gross product for Hampton Roads to be 2.2%, and uh, we have not seen anything above 2.2% for uh, the last decade. So this is this is the strongest uh, growth year that I've ever forecasted for Hampton Roads, um, and I think that that's significant in the way that we know that this year is going to be good. 
We saw some pretty healthy growth last year, so last year and this year looked good for Hampton Roads. But when I look to see what the tea leaves are showing for 21, 22, we know that you know this is our good period. We have a good year ahead of us. We likely have a good year ahead of us. But beyond that, it's much more difficult to read. We expect uh, civilian employment to come up 1.2%. Uh, uh, unemployment rate to stay right around where it is uh, with an expansion. <coughs> Uh, retail sales to continue on, on a relatively healthy year that we had here. Auto and truck sales is kind of interesting. Uh, they peaked in 2006. They've been in decline ever since, so we've been forecasting a decline. We, we think the decline is going to slow, uh, but fewer people are buying vehicles, and vehicles are getting much more expensive, so that's what's impacting the negative forecast there. And then finally, the value uh, single-family residential building permits. 3% growth off of pretty low uh, 2018, so we'll continue moving forward. Expectation is that we'll continue moving forward with building permits, uh, but not to where we need to be. Uh, that concludes my forecast. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Any questions? Greg, thank you very much. That was a good job. And, um, so real quick, I know we have tight time today, but I just want to plant a seed on a couple of things. So as Greg indicated, this year was sort of the good times, right? Yes. Greg like said, we're, we're going to see growth this year, but we know there's things on the horizon that if we're not pulling the right levers, we're not going to see that sustained. Um, if I could keep that slide up on the screen, please. Um, what we have on the screen here, that comes up in a moment, are just a couple of things that we're advancing regionally that hopefully start to set the table for economic growth and expansion that's sustainable in the longer term. Things like the regional fiber network, starting on the south side, extending to the peninsula. You've heard about a regional economic development site inventory that you're going to get a report on coming up. We're trying to inventory our sites and determine what we need to do to make them shovel ready, to be ready for businesses to locate. Um, we've been involved with the restructuring of Veretta as a regional economic development organization and how important that is. Um, our peninsula localities, through their Go Virginia Peninsula Land Systems Initiative, have established a revenue sharing model that could potentially be considered uh, for uh, other localities on the south side to participate in. And if we can come together to get some of these sites prepared, that could be a path forward. And then we supported offshore wind as an economic development opportunity. Um, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to kind of see that ask, we're going to be coming to you with a work program in May. Um, for this body to play a leadership role to sort of take Greg's information and then pivot forward, and are there the things that we start to do as a region to make certain we're not cyclical that we can ensure longer-term economic growth? There are things that we don't have on this list that we ought to be doing. I just wanted to pose that question. Yes. I'm going to get back on the marketing uh, course here. I don't see anywhere in our region that we are collectively working on a regional initiative to brand who we are as Hampton Roads. I'm not talking about the name, but I'm talking about the quality of life that we have here. And um, we talk a lot about the cyclicality. We, we, uh, we talk about tourism as such a big part of who we are. Um, we also talk a lot about flooding in our area. And what I've said in Norfolk is, we're going to have to deal with flooding in Norfolk. It better be a damn great place to live, right? <laughs> so you've got to enjoy the water, not just fear it. And so I really think as, because nobody else is tackling this, and maybe I'm missing something, I think the HRPDC, in conjunction with our partners, should really start to look at how do we market ourselves as a region. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I would also uh, think that when it's appropriate for the region to jump on um, the Jefferson Lab as it goes forward with its uh, competition with possibly New York. Uh, that, that's all Amazon. Yeah. I mean, it, it has the impact on this region with jobs and the economy. Yeah, thank you. Right. Any others? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I believe we have to take action on a great report on their number eight. Correct. Didn't know if there's anything else we need to add. Thank you. All right, I hear a motion for approval 
to uh, release the economic forecast. So moved. Second. All in favor, say by saying aye. Aye. All pros, nay. Any abstentions? Okay. And number nine, we've already covered with, um, Bob covered that. So our next is our um, schedule. As you all can read, there's no need to be reading through all that as we go through everything. And for your information, do an old business and a motion for adjournment. All right, second. All in favor, say aye. Thank you all. Be careful out there. Drive up safe. Thank you.